Polarizing players. If you have them, should you be selling them? If you don't have them, should you be buying them? Let's find out. There really doesn't seem to be more of a polarizing player in fantasy right now than Christian Watson. He is the literal definition of a boom bust player. Here's the good. He's a second round wide receiver set to be the premier wide receiver one for the Green Bay Packers offense. And even though he essentially missed the entire first half of his rookie season with a knee and hamstring injury from weeks 10 through 18, he was the wide receiver eight in points per game with 17.2 ahead of AJ Brown, Tyreek Hill, and Stephon Diggs. However, there are a lot more red flags in his profile than we would like to see, starting with the drop in quarterback quality from last year to this year, going from Aaron Rodgers to Jordan Love. And even if you're the biggest Jordan Love fan in the world, you can't deny the drop off in talent there, and that has to be mentioned. And then you look deeper into his production in the second half of last season, and you see it basically all came in a four week stretch, which accounted for almost 40% of his season long receptions, 50% of his yards, and all seven of his touchdowns scored were in those four weeks. Another suspicious aspect of that four week stretch is it came during the four games that Romeo Dobbs missed all season long. So it was just Christian Watson and Alan Lazard at wide receiver in those games. And then as soon as Romeo Dobbs came back, Watson came crashing back down to earth and averaged fewer than 10 fantasy points per game, no different than Kendrick Bourne during your fantasy playoffs, no less. Then you look at how his rookie production compares historically. Like for example, here is the list of rookie wide receivers since 2000 who caught seven or more touchdowns on under 90 targets. And you'll see names like AJ Brown, who obviously is elite, and also Juju and Hollywood Brown on here as well, who have each had varying levels of success. But after that, it's Darius Slayton, Anthony Miller, Gabe Davis, Martavis Bryant, all guys who fit a very certain mold of player archetype in the NFL, and we've all had hope for to hit but just never really put it all together, never came to fruition. Or you could look at first and second round rookie receivers who played at least 12 games, but saw under 70 targets, again, since 2000 up to 2020. And we have 58 receivers in this data set. And of those 58, only 17 of them ever had a top 24 season after that rookie season. And only 10 of those wide receivers posted multiple top 24 seasons and weren't just one year wonders. There are some big names in here too, like Chad Ochocinco, Reggie Wayne, Roddy White and two former Packers wide receivers in Jordy Nelson and Devontae Adams. So when some of them do hit, they hit really big. But again, 10 out of 58 is just 17%. If he's not part of that 17%, he's then at best going the way of Nelson Aguilar or Dion Branch or Sidney Rice or Devontae Parker. So really it comes down to what you choose to believe about Christian Watson. Is he the guy that we saw do really well over the last half of the season where he paced for 70 for 1100 yards in double digit touchdowns because of the type of explosive, just freak athletic player that he is? Or do you believe that he's still a raw receiver and route runner who may be hampered by weak quarterback play in 2023 and maybe not completely overshadowed but can't really make his mark on a team that just invested three top 80 picks on pass catchers in this past draft? For me, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not really looking to straight up buy him, but I wouldn't sell him unless you're able to easily upgrade to like DK Metcalf, Devonta Smith, Stephon Diggs, Cooper Cup, guys of that nature. Or if you can get like Christian Kirk in a 2025 first or Hollywood Brown in in a 2025 first or Brandon Ayuk and a second round pick. If you're not getting those types of trades, then just hold on to him for the pure upside that he possesses if he does hit. Now we can't talk about polarizing players without also talking about Alexander Madison, who has been thrust into the starting role in Minnesota. And while a ton of people are thrilled that he's finally getting an opportunity, there are others that are questioning not only his long-term ability as a starter, but also his effectiveness in 2023 alone. Now we've seen from Dalvin Cook that the workhorse role in Minnesota is a fruitful one with four straight 1300 total yard seasons and a career best of 1900 yards and 17 total touchdowns in 2020, including a very healthy floor from the receiving game. And all of that has led to three RB1 seasons in the last four years. We've also seen Madison's ability himself as the starter with Dalvin Cook injured, averaging over 20 fantasy points per game in six starts without Cook, handling a workload of roughly 23 touches per game. That is the upside that we could see with an entire season of Alexander Madison as the starter in 2023. But on the flip side, there has been a lot of analysis done questioning Madison's, uh, we'll call it effectiveness, we'll say, with the ball in his hands. Like this tweet from Rich Rebar showing Madison's
ratings below average metrics in yards per carry, success rate, explosive run rate, and yards per carry after contact. Or this tweet from Jordan Vanek showing Madison's horrendous metrics against light boxes, which Madison's going to see a ton of those with defenses focusing on Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson. And Madison has been absolutely terrible in yards per carry and yards after contact per attempt against light boxes, while Davin Cook has significantly been better in those situations in both metrics. Now, does any of this matter if he's going to see 250 carries and get 50 targets this season? Probably not, and that would all but guarantee him a top 10 finish at the position in 2023. But I think what it does highlight are areas where the Vikings may look to other running backs to fill in those gaps, thus dropping Madison's ultimate ceiling. And it also highlights that Madison is probably not their long-term answer at the position because he's just not really that good. So while, yes, you may get a fantastic 2023 season from him, you should also recognize that he's really no different than Derrick Henry, James Conner, Aaron Jones, those types of players where his shelf life is extremely limited because there really isn't all that much of a future. And all those running backs are way more talented and have way more decorated bodies of work throughout the years than Alexander Madison. So like Christian Watson, he's a guy that I'm fine holding on to if you've had him this whole entire time and he's like your RB3, RB4 on a contending team. But if you're able to move him for a more established or more solidified player, guys like Zach Charbonnet, DeAndre Swift, maybe even Javante Williams, I would be willing to do that even on a contending roster. Not to mention if you'd be able to add just like a second round pick and go up and get Najee Harris or Kenneth Walker, I'd be doing those trades too in a heartbeat. But speaking of Kenneth Walker, this offseason has just really not been kind to this kid, and the fantasy community has thrown a lot of hate his way strictly because of Zach Charbonnet's presence. And while I do agree that Sharb is an issue and his skill set is like 90% Walker on the ground, but a lot better in short yardage situations and in the receiving game, that still doesn't mean that there's no longer a highly involved role for Kenneth Walker in this Seahawks offense. Actually, since Pete Carroll took over back in 2010, the Seahawks have averaged over 430 touches in a season to the running back position on offense, including multiple seasons with 400 plus carries alone and another couple seasons in the 380s and 390 carries as well, plus a minimum of 50 plus receptions to the entire group every single season. That is more than enough volume for both Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet to thrive on for fantasy, where both of them could be top 30 backs, just like we saw last year with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, or a better version of that is Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott, who actually were both top 24 running backs last year. This can and has happened in the past, where two backs from the same team share the workload on a run-first team, and both are very good for fantasy. And Seattle is probably just going to be another example of this moving forward. Now, all of this to say is it's really hard to warn buying into Kenneth Walker at top 12 dynasty prices. I would rather have guys like Josh Jacobs, Tony Pollard, Najee Harris, Nick Chubb, Ramondre Stevenson, and Travis Etienne still over Kenneth Walker straight up, all of whom are going in and around Kenneth Walker in ADP and ranking. So if you have Kenneth Walker and you can easily pivot to any of them, I would be doing that immediately. But I also believe if the Walker manager in your league is just really trying to get rid of him and you're able to move Dobbins in a second, Javante in a second, Damian and Pierce in a second, Cam Akers in a second, Alexander Madison in a second, an upgrade from any of those question mark players to a 22-year-old stud running back who we know is elite when given the workload, then yeah, I'm making all of those moves as well if you're trying to go up to get Kenneth Walker. But honestly, the biggest takeaway from researching the Seahawks backfield should be that Zach Charbonnet is massively undervalued as his current dynasty price. And Justin lays out a fantastic argument for why you should be buying not only Charbonnet, but three other players in this video right up here.